You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Keith Johnson. After Buzz TV. the AfterBuzz studios in Los Angeles, California. Presented by Maria Menounos and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies. This is AfterBuzz TV's Girl Meets World After Show. We'll break down tonight's episode and get you all the latest news and gossip. And now, another post-game wrap-up show for your favorite TV show. It's AfterBuzz TV's Girl Meets World After Show. Hello, After Buzzers. We're here during our very first After Buzz TV after show for Disney's Girl Meets World. I'm your host, Kristen Elizabeth Snyder, and joining me, After Buzz TV host Lee Epstein. Hey guys, how's it going? We have two very special guests for you today. We have Disney development executive Corey Marsh. Hello. And we have the creator and executive producer behind Boy Meets World and Girl Meets World with us. Please welcome Michael Jacobs. Hi. Thank you guys so much for being here and taking the time to chat with us today. Of course. We're so thrilled that Girl Meets World is finally here. Our favorite show is back. Yeah, so are we. What's it mm. been, about six years? <laughs> More like 14. And after all that time, what's amazing is that the show never went off air. And the fandom continues to grow each year. And before we talk into a, more about Girl, I want to talk about Boy for a minute. Right. And just why, what it is that has touched so many people about this show. I feel like, you know, it's a human desire to want to make a difference in the world and work towards seeing that in human culture and society. And I feel like you've kind of come in at a crucial time in our lives where we were experiencing heartache and heartbreak for the first time. And your words kind of unraveled life's little mysteries for us. And we all kind of found home in this show. What kind of fulfillment do you get from writing for middle school age kids who are going through those crucial times in their lives? Well, I had four of them at home. <laughs> And, and I was really writing it for them. Um, the the thing the thing was about it, and I, I told it to my writers. That same staff that was Boy Meets World for the most part, the core of the staff, mm -hmm. is the staff of of Girl Meets World. Um, the first thing we do is we talk about what's going on on, on our real lives. We we all have children, um, and we base the stories and what the dialogue is. Uh, on reality versus some television invention. I think that's the thing that caught on about Boy. I think that there were real people. Uh, ben Savage was not and is not uh, a six foot tall, uh, blonde, blue eyed television star. Mm -hmm. Ben's an everyman. Uh, even Ryder, Danielle, um, they were real. Uh, Danielle played a character that was, at first, a very interesting Earth Mother personality. And then, as Danielle grew to be what she is in, in life, so did the character. But on Girl Meets World, she'll be visited by the original character. So you have that to look forward to. Um, I think that the, the simple answer to your question is that when people feel real things, an audience associates with that. And in Girl Meets World, as well as Boy, uh, there's at least one moment of reality that you'll be able to take away and know that these characters are feeling something. Absolutely. I feel anytime someone talks about Boy Meets World, they just radiate pure joy whenever they start talking about it. And that's to your achievement in getting through and providing those values in television, because if you look at TV right now, there's really nothing like Boy, which is why we're so excited that Girl is here. Oh, it's nice of you to say. I, um, Corey Marsh called me in the beginning, and what your words are were his, that he grew up with, with the original show, and he didn't sense anything on the air that had a mix of sensitivity to character and reality of situation, and that's how this all was born. Corey, can you kind of talk about how this first became an idea to reality? Yeah, sure. Well, Michael actually came in and pitched the Disney Channel a completely different idea, which I'm sure he doesn't remember what the idea was. But yeah, maybe... it was about a teacher. 
It was, a, it was about a teacher who would teach real life. Very mm -hmm. different. <laughs> <laughs> Completely different show. And I remember him walking out of the office and thinking to myself, like, this is like, to me, like the LeBron James of writers. I shouldn't pump Michael's ego right now. But, <laughs> but it was. And he was walking out and I realized, like, I grew up on Boy Meets World and I might never see this guy again. And I remember walking over to the elevator and saying to him, you know, Michael, Michael. And I was like a, a seventh grade boy asking a girl out for the first time. And I was like, Michael, will you please go to Jerry's Deli with me? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, luckily he said yes, and uh, he just spilled sort of the dish on Boy Meets World. I hadn't been asked out by anybody <laughs> in two years. How could I turn that down? We were both a little nervous on the first day. <laughs> what did you order at Jerry's? Uh, I'm sure it was just a turkey sandwich. Was we it probably kosher? ate none of it. What's the, what's the Michael Jacobs regular? Oh, always the same thing. What's that? It's their matzo ball soup, double carrots, double noodles, double rice. And the waitress says, we don't put rice as a double rice. And, <laughs> and uh, maybe half a tuna fish sandwich. Okay. Every time. Now I walk in there and they know they just have it ready. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I told that's them. That's how you know you've really made it, right? Yeah, yeah, at Jerry's. At Jerry's. Right. <laughs> well, what I learned during the pilot is Michael usually has someone actually hand feed him the food because he's so busy <laughs> writing, so I'm glad he didn't make me do that in the first meeting or this might never happen. But um, yeah, we went and we sat down for, um, I don't know, it was like three hours and we wow. were talking all about Boy Meets World. And at the end, I said, would you ever do Boy Meets World again? And he goes to me, he goes, no, absolutely not. And then, I'm, you know, I fought, felt like a complete idiot because I was like, why would I ask this guy? The show's so iconic. There's no way that he would do it again. <laughs> and then after I said that, about five seconds, he goes, what about Girl Meets World? And I go, what about Girl Meets World? He goes, what about Girl Meets World? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and that's how it all started. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, we, we got lucky. Uh, the show's never been off the air, to my knowledge. No, uh, it's yeah. not been. Right, ABC, uh, Disney Channel, uh, ABC Family, MTV2, and uh, 20, 20 years. And so when Corey said, would you do it again, I thought to myself, uh, it's tough to do a sequel anyway, mm -hmm. but Disney originally talked about a boy, which I thought about. And then I thought, uh, I keep talking about being real, uh, what would really happen? And I thought about Corey and Topanga and what would have happened to them. And I thought, well, they've got children, and one of them's a girl. Why can't we do it from a brand new point of view? But the thing I really did was I watched television, and I watched children's TV. And I thought to myself, if I could do something that was unique to that genre, and what seems to be unique to the genre is real people and real feelings, and that's what we're going for. And so I told Corey, if you'll let me do it this way, I would be happy to do it. And they've agreed, and they've been flexible about that. So was there any other idea besides Girl in your mind at all to do as a sequel? Yeah, we were going to we were going to do um, this uh, uh, we were going to call him the imp and there was going to be the mother of dragons. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought that would be great. And then, uh, as I said, I watched television and it was taken. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, though, speaking of dragons, you did do the dinosaur show. We did do Which dinosaurs. is hilarious because when I first met you, you had told me a story, I think, about Daniel and how you had asked him, like, his favorite show on TV if he thought Boy was his favorite. And he actually said, well, I like this show Dinosaurs a little bit better. Right, it's a great story, <laughs> Kristen. It's not Danny. It's his brother, okay. Josh. Um, I'm sorry, Danny. i got to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Danny's here. Is it? But um, Josh was was six years old and thought that I did everything on television. Mm -hmm. And and because mostly he watched TGIF. Mm -hmm. And so he he said, my daddy does all the, and, no, don't say that. And 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 <laughs> what I need you to do is I need you to go find another show that isn't mine. And he came back a couple of days later and said, I like this show with this baby dinosaur that says, not the mama. Is that okay? And I went, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I still watch it. It's on Netflix yeah, to it's this a, day. It, I just yeah. watch it. it still holds up for a 20-year-old show. There are some episodes of that show that are really quite good. Um, about holding up. Boy holds up better. Uh, the interesting thing about Boy is that, that dinosaurs is still... At its, at its core, uh, animatronics. And mm -hmm. so we could get away with much more, and we did. We, we were 
more over the top on dinosaurs. So when is this I, a bad time to ask you if you'll redo dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make Girl Meets Dinosaurs. Girl Meets Dinosaurs. Oh, that, can that be an episode, please? Yeah. Uh, so what message do you guys now want to send to this new generation with Bringing Back Girl? What do you want to send? You know, for me, it's I want someone to grow up 20 years from now and be my age and say, like, how did it affect, how did it compel them to live a certain dream? Because you always said to me during the pilot, you're like, compelling is always more important than comedy in life or in writing. And I thought to myself, like, I was compelled because of Boy Meets World to go down this road and do Girl Meets World. And I didn't know I was going to get that, to that path, but I followed the path of TV because of that show. And I'd hope that Girl Meets World does the same for a new generation. Well, it's interesting, because you're right. The, the, we've just come from a mix, and a mix is when you take the show after it's been edited, and you put in music, okay. and you do the final sections before broadcast. The show we just mixed is the reunion episode. Oh, I've heard about this. Yeah, when the, when the original cast of Boy visits the cast of Girl. Mm -hmm. And it really becomes a story about Ryder, about Sean Hunter. And um, Ryder, in the beginning, was, he was never reticent about the, sh the show itself. It was that Ryder has carved a completely different path for himself. Mm -hmm. And when he heard about this he he it was the al pacino line in godfather <laughs> just when i'm out okay and and <laughs> but he was compelled by the show he's going to be a regular director for girl meets world wow. he directed two episodes last season but this episode when Ryder comes back he'll be doing two episodes this season there is an arc this is the episode that told me we had a series because in the middle of this episode Riley has an agenda for Ryder. She takes Sean, his character, and wants to change it radically. Wow. And Sean and Corey and Topanga are in this episode representing the original series. Mm -hmm. Riley and Maya have something going on that is antithetical to the original series. And we have a live audience. And the live audience tells us if we're doing well. They were rooting for the girls. Wow, Ooh. that's fantastic. The cheers and screams when Ryder appears, when Alan and Amy appear, when Rusty and Betsy appear. In fact, uh, there's a character that was uh, my son Danny, who's sitting right there. He played this character in the finale, which is that little boy, Joshua Matthews, who Corey talks to. Uh, in the end, and uh, he's part of the series because he's 16 years old now. So um, the agendas of the old series met and clashed with the agendas of the new series. And I'll tell you that the audience, everybody there, jumped over to Riley and what she wanted. And when wow. you see what it is, and when that sort of goes much further in the second writer appearance, I think that both audiences, old and new, will be very satisfied with what we've done. Well, that speaks volumes to Girl Means World in the direction that it's going, and I cannot wait to see mm. that reunion episode. But I, we had uh, some Twitter questions. We have the BMWSequel.com ask, is it difficult to reach a new audience while still trying to satisfy the Boy Meets World fans? Yeah. Uh, I'll, do you want you answer and I'll answer? Go ahead. You know, I, I think it, at its core, you have to know the show's a kid's show, but there's a lot there, I think, for adults, too. Of all the Disney Channel shows, I think it's the show with the, the most sort of parental supervision in there. The parents have their own scenes. It feels real. It's something that kids can watch and still relate to what their parents are doing, and something that the old audience who wants to see Corey and Topanga are watching, this is the continuation of their story. So yeah. To me, that's one of the most special things about Boy Meets World, and also what I've seen of, of Girl, um, there is this writing and acting that's like that a kid and an adult and everyone in between can enjoy this show and learn from the show at the same time, which I think is just really special. And could you talk about that from a writing perspective, a creating perspective of that you're creating something that's for kids and for their parents and for their older brothers and sisters? And What's, what, what is that process for Yeah, that, that goes hand in hand with Kristen's question as well. The difficulty is this. Um, it's not difficult at all to write a family show. 
it's 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 what I do. It's difficult it's for me to write Game of Thrones, but, it, <laughs> but, but certainly to to write a family show is is what I've always done. There's not a lot of family shows on television right now. You got Modern Family, and and where there was a complete lack of that, when Modern Family came on the air, it just went wild. It wins the Emmy every year, and it certainly says that people want to see it. The the dichotomy that you're talking about is I, when this pilot airs, I guess, or or I should say, this pilot just aired a minute ago, right? So mm -hmm. so when this pilot aired, the pilot's very different than the episodes because we all had to find out what we were and what we could do uh, to make this not only palatable, but liked by what we used to refer to as a bimodal audience, which is, um, I'll give you an example. Kids bring parents to a hit. Parents don't bring their kids. Um, this may be the rare exception because parents will have had the experience of knowing what, what boy was and say to their children, I want you to sit here and watch this mm -hmm. because it's a safe, good place. But normally kids find a hit and they bring their parents because they want to spend time with their parents. But there's nothing in this world that they really have in common. But this show is an interesting dichotomy, as I say. So when you do the pilot, and that's what we're going to be judged on in the beginning, it is so unfair <laughs> to judge 156, 158 right. episodes of television and a trajectory, an arc toward a trajectory of character against a 22-minute pilot. We love the pilot. Uh, it was a difficult pilot to do because we wanted two distinct groups to come and want to stay. But I will tell you that when Corey, uh, I think Corey always knew, um, when the rest of the network saw that it was possible to write a little bit more adult thematically to make these characters have hearts and minds that weren't so young in aspect that they didn't resemble future adults, I think that everybody will come. Uh, I will tell you that Rowan and Sabrina, as, as well as Peyton and, and Corey Fogelmanis, <laughs> are wonderful. But let them arc, because they grow over this season. You won't recognize them at the end of the season. They so evolve, they're so good at growing that the children who begin in the pilot evolve very quickly. I know that the original audience will love that, but what I'm betting is that the new audience is going to love that too, because they will be guided to what comes next in their own lives. I don't know if I want to see Augie grow. I kind of like him just like this. But. <laughs> I think what you know this cast has in common is obviously growing under you, who are such a fantastic executive producer and director with the kids. I mean, they are going to grow in that same direction because you're the one in charge. So uh, that's nice of you to say. <laughs> um, I have four kids of my own. Uh, and the kids that have been my network kids, and there have been a lot of them, as, as well as my own kids, none of them has ever knocked off a liquor store, to my knowledge. <laughs> none of them has robbed a gas station. Still got time. There, yes. There, you hear Danny? Oh, da Danny's gone. Danny's gone to get gas. They, uh, they, 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 um, they've all grown up very well. It's not me. What it is, is <laughs> I talked about a safe place. Mm -hmm. Our set's a real safe place. Um, Ryder Strong came to me and quit the show. And I think it was year <laughs> four or five. He said, wow. well, I'll be leaving the show now. And I said, oh, we'll be sad to see you go. How come, Ryder? And he said, well, I have to go to college. And I said, well, you're absolutely right. Can I ask you something? And he said, what? I said, do you have so little faith that I don't know that you're not going to go to college and we'll make your schedule very friendly for you. And he said, you would do that? And he was sort of choking back. Oh. 
all of this emotion because I think that it troubled him, that he wanted to live a normal life. And he still does. But we made everybody able to do whatever they wanted to do. And we'll always do that because if we're doing a show about coming of age, I sure want to let you come of age. Oh. Mm. I, I read part of um, Rachel's blog that she did with you, the Word and Film blog. You guys can follow her at Word and Film, and it's a fantastic blog. Michael's and, daughter, Rachel. Yes, her, his daughter, Rachel. And she had this quote that you had talked about, that someone had said, don't aspire to be Corey and Topanga. It will only bring you heartache. This relationship isn't achievable by human beings. And you said, I don't believe that. The aspiration to love must be chased and must be won. Yeah. And that's so beautiful. And that's exactly what Boy Meets World had taught us is to, you know, it's all about love. It's all about, you know, the people there, the fanciful to the mundane. It's who's around you and you should fight to keep that love. We actually have a caller on the line who wants to ask you guys a question. Right. Caller, what's your name? Where are you from? Hi, my name is Ari Rosenblum and I'm from Forest Hills, New York. Thanks for calling, Ari. Do you have a question for Corey? No and Yeah, I have a question for Michael Jacobs. Um, so, w watching the show as uh, someone who's familiar with Women's World, uh, watching the pilot, it was very clear that the theme of the, of the episode was mostly establishing Riley's world and showing us that this is Riley's world. And the way that we define Riley's world, at least for me as a you know viewer who's, who knows Women's World, is defining it against Corey's world of Women's World. So I was wondering, uh, while you were the creator and the writers also, how you felt the world is different now, like versus what Corey's world was from Women's World to, to now what it is with Riley? How has it changed? Oh, that's a good question, Ari, and thank you for it. The, um, the thing that I've been saying all along, and I said it to Corey day one, is one of the reasons I want to do this show is because the world in 20 years is much different. And I'll give you an example. Um, when we did the last episode of Boy Meets World, uh, um, and of course throughout the series, no cell phones, uh, mm -hmm. no technology, no emoticons. Uh, people actually looked each other in the <laughs> eyes, and they spoke to each other. And in 20 years, um, with the the so-called advancement of technology, <laughs> it's the devices in our pockets that seem to command what our emotional state of being is. This is a huge difference in the world of children and young adults. Uh, the next episode, and uh, it's not on next week because next week is the July 4th weekend. Mm -hmm. It'll be on the following July 11th. Week, Ju July 11th and then uh, every Friday night at 8.30, just like Boy Meets World for a while. And then ABC put it on at 9 o'clock, 9.30, 8 o'clock. <laughs> um, but but uh, I'm, I'm hopeful Disney will keep this here. Um, the second episode, the first after the pilot, uh, is an episode I've wanted to write for a long time. And I got to do it with this cast. It basically says, Corey Matthews wants to know, what is the advantage of living a life packed in a device? Riley says within the episode, I have 364 friends right here. And Corey mm -hmm. says, and it troubles me that you believe that. Mm -hmm. And wow. so, and what happens is, in what would be a Boy Meets World twist, Corey's wrong. Something happens to Riley in that episode that that Corey at the very end of the episode feels much safer with Riley on her phone. <laughs> um, emotions are a dangerous thing. And when they are allowed to grow, especially in kids that don't quite know how to handle them in this new and different world, well, that's a good television episode. If you like the pilot at all, <laughs> you will love the next episode. It's it's better. And the one after that is better than that. Mm. And that, I think, is a good series. That's a fantastic answer. And thank you, Ari, for calling in and asking a question. Yeah, thanks, Ari. While we're on the subject, can you talk about, are we still going to get those hard-hitting subjects and those hard-hitting you know, themes of not having parents at home, like we kind of did this episode? Um, how, what are the parameters of your writing now? It, it's funny. I'm going to let, I, I want, I'm going to actually answer first, and then I want Corey to come back, because I'm about to talk about the network itself and, and what I perceive is happening, and, and then Corey will respond, being the executive from that <laughs> network. Um, when we cast Rowan, um, I was told that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to cast an 11-and-a-half-year-old girl. 
And the reason for that is I think that the spokesman for the generation that, that Disney is reaching more successfully than any other network in this genre, you want to know what comes next. Um, so a 14-year-old girl is going to be wonderful for girls who are 8, 9, 10, 11 years old to watch because it's either their older sister mm -hmm. or their aspirational older sister. I wrote the pilot and I brought in 14-year-old girls who were very good to read the lines. The problem was you can't do a coming-of-age comedy about girls who've already come of age. <laughs> and I think that the reason they've come of age is what the first episode is going to explore. They have three screens. They have one in their pocket. They have the television screen. They have their computer screen. They have movie screens who say, you are not 14. You're 20. <laughs> and I think that what the access is to those screens and their ability to have knowledge that perhaps they shouldn't have there's no way to say, whoa, once that's opened. But there is a way, and girl is going to do it, to say, are you better off? And we're going to do it well. And what I'm hopeful for, if you want to talk about issues, is innocence is not bad. Hold on to it. The world is a rough place. And Disney Channel let me cast 11 and a half Rowan Blanchard, probably because Disney Channel knew we wouldn't be on the air for a year. But, <laughs> but, but the, the, the thing is, is that Rowan now, at 12 years old, is in 1993, when boys started, what they were at the end of the series. She's got spectacular knowledge. Sabrina, certainly, at least as much. What you're getting from this young cast is much more evolved than I perceive you would get from a 14-year-old cast, which would be artificial and you wouldn't believe. And I'll throw it to Corey now. You know, for me, the scariest moment of the pilot was uh, when Sabrina's character, Maya, says, I had nobody at home to do my homework with me. And I think for the network, we'll point back to it as a really... Um, significant moment because I don't think any of us, maybe Michael will say he did know, but I don't think any of us were sure that when we went and tested the pilot whether kids would respond to that. If you look at most of our shows, there's some big block comedy scene um, leading into that third act um, that's s smart but also just really funny and that moment was just emotional. But I remember from the testing there was this deep breath of fresh air when all the kids said their favorite moment was that because yeah. it was relatable. And I would love to have that in every show going forward because you never know until you try it, and it's a big impact moment. Well, it goes beyond that if we're telling the truth here. What, what, there's, there are certain philosophies that come in success, and Disney is successful. Um, ending an act on a comic moment would seem to be de rigueur, would be the way a comedy... But the funny thing is, is... It's funnier to me to go out on something you th and come back and hit that moment comically. Um, we don't end an act on that moment. Uh, the act ends on a very comic moment. Um, uh, since you've seen the pilot, the, the act ends on Corey Fogelmanis' Farkle crawling up his teacher and mm. holding on for dear life in a rainstorm. Um, the next thing that happens is we come in on that moment. Now, perceive if we would have ended on that moment. It would have been at least as interesting, probably more interesting, but I will tell you that everybody has to be brought along. They're, they're, look, n networks do friends, and then 10 years of friends clones, and, and a couple of them will work, but most of them will never see the light of day. Um, when you're doing something that is perceived as new, and it's not new because we've obviously already done it, it's just new to today. I think that Disney has been remarkably flexible in looking at a form they're the best at and saying, wait a minute, there's room here. And not only is there room, the kids are hyper-responding to what's new because TV runs in cycles. And kids for the last cycle have seen um, 
I don't want to say repetitive, but I do want to say tried and true for them. I think they're ready to move to something else. That doesn't mean that every show on this or any other network will be the same, but it does mean if this is a template for something that's a little more real, good for us and good for you. I think it's definitely needed at this point in time, so I'm so glad that you're back in action. And I want to talk about the Girl Meets World opening title sequence for a little bit. So, I obviously, since I was a Boy Meets World fan, I noticed, you know, the text being a lot like boy, and the, the O in the world is a globe, and the airplane, everyone loves the airplane. And so, Sabrina Carpenter and Rowan Blanchard actually sang this song, right? Right. Uh, the song is wonderful. We, um, I write a lot of my theme songs for my shows. And you I, wrote the song. No, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tried to write one, uh -huh. and uh, I wrote it with my, my writing partner, Ray Colcord, who does our music, who does the, the interstitial cues, and Ray's done every major comedy, and he's done all of mine, uh, and, and he's terrific. And we wrote a theme, and it was in competition right up until we heard this theme. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened was Disney called me and very gently said, we think we've got you beat. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, cut it out. You crushed us, <laughs> killed us. And, and the song is fantastic. We're very happy. We're, I'm about lyrics. Mm -hmm. And the lyrics of the song, its melody is catchy and wonderful. Float that paper plane beautifully because it was the paper plane that I wanted to do. Yeah. Adam Bennett, uh, uh, in the beginning, said, what about the paper plane? He loved the paper <laughs> plane. I said, I'm glad you said that because it's what I wanted to pitch to you. So we were in concert about that, and the song just really allows it to float. So we're mm -hmm. very happy with the song. I hope the audience is. Will you ever switch out your song that you created? Will we ever hear any of that? My song is dead. Oh, <laughs> my, my song that. is as I dead don't know. as could How many theme songs did Boy Meets World have over the course yeah. of the Boy, Boy Meets World had four or five theme songs, but m my song, unfortunately, does not beat this theme song, and we are not going to have a, a second one until we beat this theme song. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so that's the way we'll go. Can Michael's, I ask you? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, Michael's going home right after this to go right again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, knew it. Exactly. I know Michael. He, he wants to beat it no matter what. I didn't say I was giving up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, Michael, who your, since you mentioned it, that you're a lyrics guy, who your musical influences are. And, you're, you know, we, everyone talks about your television work, but you are also a songwriter, so what's your, who are your musical influences? Oh, that's easy. Uh, it's Dylan and, uh, it's Bob Dylan and Paul Simon. I was always a folky. And 90% <laughs> and, uh, of it is Bob Dylan and Paul Simon. Of the course. lyrics guys. Yeah, Lennon and McCartney, James Taylor, Carole King. Um, to see the resurgence of Carol King, the fact that you go to Broadway and you are looking at what went on in the Brill Building, which I'll tell the audience watching, the Brill Building was the place in New York City where all the songwriters went in the 50s and 60s, maybe even up to the 70s. Um, Carol King, uh, Neil Sedaka, um, uh, Neil Diamond, uh, uh, singer-songwriters, and it was room after room after room of hit songs coming out of this one building in New York City. Um, you know how you talked about before uh, the state of the world influencing? My daughter, Rachel, who we were talking about, mm -hmm. um, she did a paper in high school that was wonderful. What it was was the cultural influence of what we look at and hear based on wartime versus peacetime. During the Vietnam era, the songs, the lyrics, the, the Dylan, Simon, Lennon, McCartney, what came out of that era, as opposed to peacetime, what followed the Vietnam era um, after Springsteen and U2 um, was Britney Spears, the Backstreet Boys, and In Sync. No, great, it's great, uh, uh, gigantic. Uh, uh, sellers of records, and everybody knows the songs. But lyrically, there's a vast difference. Now, the world is again a bit troubled, as it was in the late 60s. All of a sudden, listen to the lyrics. Um, in Girl Meets World, it's going to be very pretty pictures. It's a gorgeous cast. Listen to the words. 
I also wanted to talk about how we saw a flashback of Topanga in the opening sequence. Can we expect other flashbacks throughout the other episodes? That character will visit. Uh, in fact, I'll let you know. It's episode one, two, three. Counting the pilot, <laughs> I believe it's episode five. I'm um, writing it down. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, it's the first visit from the original manifestation of Topanga. And the reason is, it's very funny, everybody said, oh, don't let there be a pudding shop. And, and, and <laughs> there, was, there wasn't going to be a, What happens is, as we put together a show, what's different for me mm -hmm. is I didn't realize that any thought you have, any casting sheet you sent out, you're reading about it the next day. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, Corey's got a, a set. He's got the schoolroom set. I really want Topanga to have a set. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the complaints um, in the in the early reviews, which I've been reading, and I know this way lies madness, but I've been reading everything. <laughs> and and, 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 and uh, I like to say that almost overwhelmingly, all of the reviews in almost all of the papers are very positive. Very they, positive. they are very positive, and I don't dwell on that. I dwell on the ten <laughs> percent that are negatives, <laughs> and my poor kids know that. Um, but but the, but one of the things that was said, and I'll prove it to you is uh, not enough to pang in the pilot. It's interesting. If it was Boy Meets World, if it was a redo of Boy Meets World, there would have been all Topanga and very little Corey. I need you guys to love the girls. I know you already love Topanga. <laughs> Believe me, there is lots of Topanga coming. The pudding shop thing, which was the template for what's Topanga's set, mm -hmm. of course Topanga's a successful lawyer. She's successful at anything she does. That's the, the manifestation of new Topanga is Topanga's on the wrong side of a case, and she knows it. And she has to defend something that she's really unhappy about. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound like a kid show, does it? <laughs> and, no. then, and, then, and then the original manifestation of Topanga comes and makes her realize she's gone too far, and she won't have it. And it's mm -hmm. a lovely meeting between the two of them. But the, um, the episode itself is about going too far and how easy the world makes it. You slip up in a second and you regret it forever. How not to slip up is what Old Topanga is all about. It's a lovely episode. I, now I want to talk a little bit about this episode and, you know, all the introduction of the characters. So first we start, you know, in Riley's bedroom and Maya's there, played by Sabrina Carpenter, who is obviously has a wild side and is going to get poor innocent Riley into trouble. And they're trying to sneak out of the bedroom to go ride the subway and, of course, Corey catches them and stops them from getting into trouble, the first time anyway. And they, we also then finally get to the subway and we meet Lucas Fryer from Texas, who's going to play, I think, Riley's interest. Now, is it possible that she could have another love interest come in? If the question is, is what you see what you're going to get, no. <laughs> Don't make assumptions based on Boy Meets World. I it's think a, a lot of us are. Please tell a, me there's more Jack K. Harris. Uh, <laughs> Jack K. has her own episode. Jack K. Harry. Yeah, Jack K. Wow. But you only know her as Jack K. She dropped her last name. And then <laughs> she. What did I say? I said Jack Harris. K. Harris. Yeah, exactly. yeah, no, Jack K. Harry. You know, Jack K. Madonna, Cher, Jack K. So, <laughs> so, um, she's the only one I know. Yeah, well, let me tell you, she's wonderful. And what you think you see on the subway is not at all what Jack K. is. And what wow. you think you see between Rowan and Peyton, we're going to grow it, but we're going to grow it real. And I want to tell you that just as I perceived, it was the University of Michigan, who, there was a school paper who wrote, Don't Aspire to Be Corey and Topanga, It'll Only Bring You Heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And Matt Nelson, who's a writer on my staff and on the original staff, went to the university and, <laughs> and called, the, the, called the, the writer up immediately, loved the article. But we defended what we're doing. Yes, Chase, love. But let me, if, if, if there's anything, Chase love. It's the most important decision you make in your life, who to go through it with. Mm. Hold on tight. I guarantee you, you will be dragged in the road, but if you get up, you're fine. Um, the, the thing about anything worth having is it takes a long time to get there. Um, I've been married going on 30 years. Mm. Uh, 
did I love my wife year one? I would have said I did year one, <laughs> but in year 30, no, it took 20 years because now I know what love is. It is not the blast of light you're expecting in the beginning. It's the calm. It's when your life is truly calm and happy. And you say, why is this? And it's because I found my Topanga. <laughs> so, so all of you, um, and the writer especially of that article, who's wonderful and who I got to have correspondence with, no, chase it. Listening um, to you is like listening to, I feel like you're the rabbi, the <laughs> guru of our, of our generation. And now another generation, which is really, really so cool that in your television and and when you speak that you, I mean, you really mean what you say. And like, I feel like I'm literally learning at your feet. This That's is, so wonderful. It's very special, really. I, I have a great rabbi. Uh, his name is, <laughs> his name is Shulweis. He's in, 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 in the Valley. Yeah. About, in the Valley. Yeah. And, and Eddie Feinstein, who's at Valley Bas Shalom. And, and, and Harold, uh, uh, Rabbi Shulweis, said to me once, I don't understand why you are not a rabbi. And I said, Harold, how many people are you reaching on Friday night and Saturday? Um. And he goes, about 300. How many are you reaching? And I said, about 24 million. He said, okay, go ahead. So <laughs> the, the thing is, I've been lucky enough to find a forum. Uh, um, Boy Meets World at its peak, uh, Dinosaurs, Charles in Charge, My Two Dads, uh, Torkels. These, these shows reach, because of the power of television, a vast audience. If we can do a little learning, as my rabbis would say, <laughs> Good. As someone who dropped out of rabbinical school to go into television, I really appreciate that story. There you go. <laughs> it just sounds like your rabbi needs to get Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't think he has a Twitter account. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Well, we get to the, the classroom, and it happens that, you know, Corey is their history teacher, teaching his daughter. And we get this awesome introduction to the character named Farkle, and his last name is Minkus, so I think it's safe to assume that this is Minkus's son. Yes, it is. And so will we see Minkus in there? You will see Minkus, episode four. Oh, we get a lot of people. Lee sure. Michael Norris, the only other Lee Michael I've ever met. Um. I'm also Lee Michael. <laughs> Lee Michael Norris. Yeah. Lee, and by the way, he, he grew up. <laughs> he, he's wonderful. Lee, Lee found his mm -hmm. Topanga, lovely wife. Uh, it's a great episode. Um, the, I really like the bond that Farkle has with Corey, just like Corey had with Mr. Feeney. Yeah, uh, and and when Lee comes in, you'll see it. And I made a mistake. It's episode seven. Okay. Um, the the uh, and that's one of our best episodes of the season. Uh, to the original audience, stay. Mm -hmm. No, no matter for those of you who left tonight, going, it's a little young. I'm telling you, stay. The the um, the the show. Uh, brings back almost all of the original cast. Uh, Lee's appearance is wonderful, and we'll see Lee again. I have to ask if we'll see Will Friedel. Well, you're not going to see Will the first year, mm -hmm. uh, and there are very good reasons for that. Um, if I have anything to do with it, uh, um, Will is very missed by us, and I am hopeful that you will get to see him. Who will be the first person to do the Feeney call on the show? <laughs> the Feeney call will not get done by anybody other than Will. Oh, so we're very we need him back. First. We need to tweet Will. Um, okay, so we start off in the classroom. We get the introduction of all the characters. The hunk, the oh no hunk no story. I love right. that. Um, and we get you know the the nerdy Minkus type coming in, and he's got this terrific bond with Corey, the teacher. And also, it seems like he is. Like Minkus thinks that he's Maya and Sabrina's friend, just like Minkus thought he was always Corey and Sean's friend. Right. But to, I'm not exactly sure where their stance is on it. I think, you know, obviously those friendships are going to develop, but I just love him being there. And a lot of people on Twitter were asking if the people who are introduced, is, is this it for the friend group, or are we going to see more friends No, you will play? see more. The, the, but the broad base of the first year is about friendship. Um, I think that friendship is extraordinarily important in life. And what we're doing, we're going to do thematic seasons. Um, the stories this year uh, show not only the value of, of friendship, but the necessity to place trust in other people and 
to sometimes be betrayed by those people and make a decision. Are they your friends? Do you want them back? What happens in friendship that makes friendship so worthwhile? As I keep saying, real. And you'll see mm -hmm. that this season. It's the bold headline of, of Girl Meets World season one. What is friendship? Um, these, these four friends form a core group that will have to answer who else gets in, who doesn't mm. get in, and who protects who, and who needs to be protected. It's an interesting year. We can see all the effort that these characters put into, you know, their love life, their friendships, their family life. And I think that's something, again, that's lacking today is just the effort that people don't put in. So it's nice to see these characters go to such lengths to keep those friendships, like we see in this episode with Riley after, Miley, after Maya starts the homework rebellion and tries to end the friendship because she thinks that's what Corey's going to make her do. You know, that's when Riley does step up and become herself and she's there for Maya, and she goes home, and she says, you know what, Corey, I, to her father, she says, I, I did do my homework. What's fighting for is friendship. Right. And, you know, that's something we all need to look at, because I feel like a lot of people just aren't putting effort into their love life all the effort that goes into maintaining a friendship. And I'm so glad that we got to see that in this first episode. I'm going to tell you something. First of all, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Kristen, yeah. I, I know Kristen because Kristen <laughs> helped us on the pilot of Girl Meets World. I, I, I'm perhaps not supposed to reveal that, but when, no, do, when do I do anything? Yeah, the, the, the thing is, your questions are great. You're doing a great job. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Um, here's uh, here's what, what I would tell you. The, the thing about these characters and the thing about the original audience looking at girl and wanting boy, I'm going to ask you to look at the pilot again. And I'm going to ask you to climb into the concept. What if Corey didn't want to be Corey Matthews in the pilot of Boy Meets World? Now, if you think this is young, I am begging you to remember that Boy Meets World's pilot ended at a tea set table with Morgan. <laughs> And Corey saying, I don't understand anything, okay? Mm -hmm. That was young. This one ends much more evolved. And, and I will tell you that my original concept here is what if Corey realized he was going to be Corey Matthews in Boy Meets World? What if Riley said, I'm not playing Corey Matthews. I want to play Sean Hunter. Mm -hmm. And once I had that thought, there was no taking me off that story. So although it seems like it's Riley wanting to be Maya, and that's what the new audience will perceive, to the old audience, it's Corey wanting to be Sean. Mm -hmm. He can't. His nature of wanting to fix everything, his nature of w going to Pittsburgh to mm -hmm. making sure that Topanga's parents are together, in one of my favorite lines of the series, when I think it was father number 87 of Topanga, when Mark <laughs> Farlick said, um, Corey, I'm seeing somebody else. And Corey realized that there was no putting them back together, simply turned to him and blurted out this boy, what's the matter with this woman? Marsha Cross, mm -hmm. who was playing Topanga's mother. That moment, to me, is devastating. Not to Mark, not to Topanga's father, or my, but to Corey. What's the matter with this woman? Corey found somebody. That relationship was threatened by Topanga's parents. What's the matter with this woman? Where are you going to get that on a kid show? We're doing that this season. You'll see plenty of that in year one. That took us quite a few seasons on mm -hmm. ABC to get to that. So I do think that if you make comparisons to Boy, think of Riley and Maya as Corey and Sean for a second, and think back to year one. They were buying water pistols and going to water wars. Mm -hmm. The emotional content of what Riley and Maya are doing. And I loved that episode. Mm -hmm. I loved My Father is Superman. And I loved Corey saying, reach under the table, Dad, and Rusty pulling out that water gun, and Betsy, <laughs> Betsy didn't me. have one. Right. <laughs> but what I love at least as much 
is the emotional content that the girls are going to go through and evolve into very quickly. You'll be shocked. We're really proud of it. We are too, and we're so excited about it. Definitely. I want to talk about, we can't ignore it, when Feeney comes back in the end and he says that, you know, Corey's doing a good job. Now, we see him as a ghost, and a lot of people online are like, oh no, did they kill off Mr. Feeney? Why did you choose to have him come in as a ghost? There were a lot of reasons. Corey was instrumental in this. Um, we shot two scenes with Bill for the pilot, and I don't mind telling you, because we're being truthful here about what happened. The, the scene we shot with Bill was wonderful and took you right out of the show. Mm. Mm. Um, what happened was Bill sat down. The original scene was in the middle of the water pouring down on everybody. Corey shakes his head and realizes he's failing as a teacher. And he goes to a picture on his desk, little picture this big, mm. that we know is Topanga. And he picks it up, and it's Feeney with his <laughs> arms crossed. And, and, and he says, I failed you. And he looks up, and the classroom is dry. And there's Bill Daniels. And he says, no, Mr. Matthews. Do you think I was always Mr. Feeney? And Corey says, I think you came out of your mother and said, hi, I'm Mr. Feeney. <laughs> and, and it was a wonderful scene. I chose not to show it. And the reason I chose not to show, which doesn't mean I won't show it eventually, but the reason I chose not to show it was Corey's the teacher. And Corey is not Feeney. Corey's confused. Corey Matthews, no matter what he does, is confused. He's a confused kid. He's a confused father. He's a confused husband. And certainly, he's a confused teacher. I so appreciate that you're saying that, that Corey is not the new Feeney, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of, for those of us who are the, you know, the 90s, 80s kids coming in to see it now, there's a lot of this comparison going on, I mean, everywhere, and right. there is a lot of that to be done, but also, this is a wonderful new show that's, it's not that Corey is the new Feeney, Corey is the new Corey, and, and we get to see him develop and, and be him, and I just really appreciate that, I think it's like worth you know, pointing out again that it's not like Corey is the new, you know, or Ben Savage is the new Bill Daniels. No, like, he's his own thing, and um, there's a lot of great new stuff in this new uh, series. That's wonderful of you to say. I will tell you, everybody listening to this, don't, don't, don't compare the series. They're two different series. You're going to love this series because the people that are bringing it to you, I know these people, and I know, the, <laughs> I know this cast, and I know what our aspiration is, but I will say to you, if we're doing something wrong, what you just said about Corey is the new Corey, tell me that you don't believe it. Tell me that you don't believe what Corey has grown into. Tell me that you don't believe what Topanga has grown into. What Riley and Maya will grow into, that's for us. That's our responsibility. But if you've watched Boy Meets World, then you have a responsibility. Tweet it. Tell me. <laughs> Believe me. I'm reading everything. I'll hear it. And if I see it, I don't care where right comes from. I'll adjust. So tell me. But, you know, one of the brilliant things that I saw over the course of the season and what makes it much different than the original is Mr. Feeney was who he was pretty much the whole series right. of Boy Meets World. But if you watch the show, you see Corey sort of going through a new coming of age for himself. You know, he's a father. He doesn't exactly know how to relate to his daughter yet. He's still having that rite of passage himself while his daughter's going through it. And I think that parallel will continue to be part of the show. Absolutely. Corey, there's an episode, uh, you were sitting there, when, when Augie um, mm. uh, takes crayons and he, he wants to, as a matter of fact, it's next week, it's in the cell phone, it's in the cell phone episode. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, um, or two weeks from now. The, the, <laughs> he, ta he takes out these crayons and he just, he just draws on everything. The new refrigerator, the walls, the, and there's wow. these, yeah, drawings are beautiful, but they're on the walls. And, and Corey and Topanga look at each other and Corey raises his hand He's going to yell at his kid, and Topanga automatically says, I think we're not supposed to do that. I think what we're supposed to say is, very nice, 
great potential, nice little art. And Corey says, no, we're supposed to yell at him. And what, and what happens here is you watch these two parents, and as children, your parents did this. They didn't know mm -hmm. what to do at their young age. They didn't? They didn't. <laughs> they grew into it. But I'll tell you, watching Corey and Topanga grow into it, old and new audience, kids will love to see parents. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. They want them to be sure. They want these kids to be safe and secure. But to watch the decision-making process from Corey Matthews and Topanga, one who's always unsure and one who always is sure, it's a lot of fun. I want to talk about the happiest place on earth. I know a lot of people think that's Disney World, but after working on the show with you, I know that's the writer's room with the original Boy Meets World and now Girl Meets World writers. You guys, you will stand up and act out a whole scene. The next day you rewrite it, but it was hilarious the first time. And just being in that room was like a dream come true, being a fan of the show. Can you talk about your writing process, how you guys develop these ideas and lay out the character arcs? Oh, I'd be glad to. Uh, before I do that, I should tell you that the happiest place on earth is Disneyland. I work for Walt Disney. Uh, the, 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 uh, the thing about uh, I'm rewriting the reruns. For 20 years, I've been doing nothing but rewriting. I see moments on Boy Meets World, and I think, how could I have done that? I think, how did I miss this? Uh, why did this go left and not right? Why did this go right and not left? The writing process is never over. When we're in front of the live audience, um, I will run out on the set um, because beat it, beat it. Yeah, it's good enough. Yeah, it's, it's good enough. We're on to next week, but it's never good enough because, you know, in, in the spark of what you're watching, beat it, always beat it. Mm -hmm. And um, the writers that I have know that. The first thing I say every morning when I come in is page one. No matter what page we're on, we first go back for an hour or two and we look to see what we can beat because every day we're a little bit older and we're a little bit better. And, and <laughs> I, I think that on Thursday we're better than we were on Wednesday. I really believe that. Um, and I'll tell you, if at the end of it, this isn't better than Boy Meets World, I missed. I Thank you for your <laughs> extreme honesty. <laughs> I have no doubt it will continue in the right direction. And like you say, as we get better every day, I truly believe that. And Topanga said, I think, in an interview that, you know, there are people who definitely put the effort forth to become a better person every day. And you can see that in the episodes. And like you said, each episode, it doubles in, you know, how great it is and the dialogue and the characters developing under you. I can't wait. I want to get into now a little interview with you guys. I want to ask you both, specifically from your childhood, what do you think directed you into becoming a writer, becoming a Disney executive of development? That was all the pre-interview that we just had. Just <laughs> okay, go. Here's the interview. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, for me, it all started, strangely enough, in an AOL chat room for the show Home Improvement. Oh, my God. Which is a, a very strange place to start. But um, I was in this chat room, and the producers were answering questions. And eventually, they said, what's your favorite show? And it was in the first season of Boy Meets World. And I said, Boy Meets World. And then this direct message came up on my screen and said, oh, your favorite show is Boy Meets World, is it? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm a producer on Boy Meets World. How would you like a signed photo and a script? And being the <laughs> naive 12 year old that I was I gave a complete stranger on the internet my home address but two days later the photo in the script showed up in my doorstep and you live to tell about it and I live to tell about it <laughs> and uh, I still have that photo today and um, at that moment when tell I got about your light switch uh, when my best friend from my birthday bought me a this was maybe 10 or 15 years ago so I was a grown adult bought me a uh, boy meets world light switch which is still in my house tell him about your Twitter handle <laughs> my Twitter handle is at Mr. Feeney fan you also want to know my license plate is Mr. Feeney but this all came way before you worked on this show right? right most of the yeah all of this came before I worked on the show but the minute I got that photo it was so crystal clear what I wanted to do with my life because I realized if one show affected me this much there must be millions of others out there and this is before Twitter where you could get that feedback and I realized if you can affect someone that much this is what I want to do with my life now little did I know 20 years later Michael Jacobs would walk into you know the office is that me being a network executive at Disney and I get the opportunity to do the show it's crazy how that happened but it did it's not crazy there's no such thing as coincidence 
Uh, I became a writer. I know the day. Um, I was always writing, all through school. I, uh, my physic. I, I'm not. I'm. What is it? Left brain, right brain. I. I I'm. Right brain is is uh, left brain is math and science. Mm. Right brain is like creative. Lefty right. Is... So right brain. And and uh, it's funny because I believe in China, they they their educational system is by middle school. Uh, I think I read this somewhere. They're separated. Uh, they know if they're right brain or left brain. Wow. I, I, I'm in school, and they're they're saying to me, uh, two and two is four, which I got. I understood the purpose and value. I know you have to count change and know what your bowling score is. But <laughs> but 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 when I got to seventh grade, and and the teacher said. Uh, X squared plus Y squared equals what? I raised my hand and quit. I, I actually quit. Wow. I, I told the teacher, I quit. Letters and numbers do not belong on the same blackboard together. And I did my English homework and math. And my report cards were English A, history A, math F, so it's <laughs> F. And um, I was, as I said, a, a songwriter. And I would go to New York City. I lived in Jersey. And, and I would go to New York City two or three times a week. And I would play my songs for, for any producers who cared to listen. I was 17, 18 years old. And there was a man named John Hammond. John Hammond discovered Dylan and Springsteen. Uh, he had a crew cut. He wore a cardigan sweater. His son is, uh, a, 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 I think, John Hammond Jr. Is, uh, is he more bluesy guy or country guy. Um, he wasn't straight rock and roll. But John Hammond discovered everybody I was ever influenced by. Mm. And I cold called them. Mm. And I and I'm 17. And I said, you've known everybody I've ever been influenced by musically was good. Could I come in and you could tell me if I'm any good? Wow. Just like that. And he said, when can you get here? And I said, four o'clock if I get on the bus now. Said, come on in. And it was strange. I, I don't know if he did this all the time, if he was mm -hmm. in a wonderful mood, but John Hammond said, come on in. I got on a bus. I went to New York, uh, Columbia Records. I went to John's office, and it was him. I recognized him from all of these black and white photos I saw with him. And, and I played him three songs, and he said, stop. And uh, I put my guitar back in the case, and he said, you are a primitive musician. <laughs> he said, this G, C, D with a minor chord. I, he said, can you not ever use G, C, D in a minor chord again? And, and uh, I said, I'm a primitive musician. I thought, it's, uh, well, OK. If he says so, I'm not a musician. And I believed it. And it was one of the few times in my life somebody told me something. But John Hammond tells me I'm not a musician. I'm not a musician. He said, but your lyrics, he said, I want you to play guitar as a hobby. He said, because you're good. He said, but professionally, you're a writer. He said, your ideas, your lyrics conceptually. How old are you? And I said, 17. He said, you're an old soul. Go out and be a writer. And he shook my hand. And I left the building, and when anybody said, what are you, I said, I'm a writer. And um, three years later, I wrote my, full, my, my first full-length play um, and went to Broadway. Right. Wow. And, and, and they, they, they started it down, down in Florida in a dinner theater, and producers came and they took it to New York. And so at 22, I was on Broadway. And it was because this man said, go write, be a writer. Uh, I'm still trying. I'm happy with my body of work, but I think of him a lot. Have you talked to him since that? No, um, I, he's, not, uh, he's not here. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, um, but did you ever revisit him and let him know that you did take I, his advice? I wasn't afraid to call him the first time. I was afraid to call him the second time. <laughs> what if he said to me, I didn't mean television? <laughs> so so, so I, I, um, I, I always remember him very fondly. He was a major influence, and the other influence was a fellow named Robert Stevens, who was my high school speech and, and writing teacher. Um, and Bob uh, ran the theater department. 
and I, I started out as an actor. And that's, I think the reason, I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse School of Theater, and I think it's the reason why I am so completely fond of actors and love working with them. Watching you work with them, and the, I, was, I visited this set a couple of times, and the way that you worked with the actors, it's like, it's really, I think it's amazing. I mean, first of all, you're like the, definitely like the dad on the set <laughs> for everyone. And also seeing how you work, um, like with Ben and Danielle, that you have a much obviously more developed relationship with them and you kind of include them on decision making and like just talking. I just see the way that you talk to people. I feel like this industry sometimes has a reputation of being people are not polite, people are not kind, people are, you know, it has a bad reputation. And when I went to that set, I was like, this is a, this is a good place to be. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. I, and it's what I said before. It is a safe place. It's it's not. I can't. I don't. I, I don't take compliments really well. <laughs> if you said I like your shoes, I won't talk to you. <laughs> but, the, but the but the but the thing you're saying about the actors on the set, the receptivity. These are young people. These are young people. The way I try to talk to them, makes them feel in notes, um, like they're adults. And I think kids like to be treated as not only adults, but as fully fleshed out human beings. And I think if you talk down to them, you are dismissed immediately and forever. And I think if you make them believe you care about what happens to them, they are receptive forever. I mean, Corey too, Corey comes to the set and he watches and, and um, the, the things that he contributes the, the relationship between the executives and, and the cast, and if it's not a family, we're not going to succeed. One of my favorite moments um, from this season was actually the last episode. And I don't go to every episode because I'm on the development side, so we're, we're making other shows for Disney Channel. But I came, and there was something that I saw and I, I, that, that connected with an earlier episode of the season. And I asked Michael if he wanted to connect it a little bit more. And I don't know if you remember this. He's like, no, I'm not doing that no matter what. And he sort of scorned me in the moment. But I know Michael, <laughs> and, and like we have that relationship. And I said to him, you still love me? And he turns around and goes, yeah, I still love you. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a very funny moment. Um, what, what Corey's talking about um, is the crux of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the second episode uh, of writer's trajectory, of Sean Hunter's trajectory. Uh, the Sean-Angela relationship will resolve. Sean's life will take a dramatic left turn. Um, what Corey wanted to do was clarify what was going to happen, and I want the audience to imagine. And what's interesting about what Corey wanted was that he was right. The sentence was absolutely unfinished. But to this audience, it is as plain as day. Oh. Well, before we wrap up, I just want to ask you guys what one of your favorite set experiences were from filming Girl Meets World. Ooh. My favorite set experience is actually before, right before we were on set. Well, there's two. Uh, on set, there was a scene. We didn't quite have it, and the, we had about 15 minutes left with the kids or, or with the actors. And we went up to the office, and Michael went up first with the writers, and he wrote for 10 minutes, and then I came upstairs. And he goes, do you love it or do you really love it? What do you <laughs> I go, I hate it. And then he, he goes, well, what do you want to write? And, and I threw out something, and Michael threw out something. And literally three minutes later, we had what I thought was one of the best scenes in the, uh, the pilot before we reshot it. It didn't end up in the final cut. But it was a very, very funny scene. Is he... you, you, yeah, what he's saying is absolutely right. We, you have to understand that in the beginning of the year, Disney Channel had massive hits on the air in a certain template. Mm -hmm. um, it was only logical that we become part of that template. But we had one stroke of enormous good fortune. There was a show on Disney Channel, and I think it was at that time its largest hit, which was Good Luck Charlie. Good Luck Charlie was a family show. And the incorporation of the adults and the kids and a cross-collateralized family was newer than, no, the show's about the kids. It's about what the kids are going to do. It's what the kids are going to And all of a sudden, a chasm opened. 
because what we were arguing about was how much can you throw to the parents to motivate the kids mm -hmm. and how much do you throw to the kids to motivate the parents well I don't want the kids to motivate the parents uh, I, I, I don't want that I don't want the kids to run the household because they don't mm -hmm. um, I want the parents to be parents and I want Corey and Topanga to evolve to that so the thing that I wasn't saying to Corey was there's a wall that I have I know what the company wants and I understand what the company wants and when I said to Corey tell me what you want do the house number tell me how you'd write it mm -hmm. and when he told me how he'd write it it was individual it wasn't company speak and that gave me the latch as to what I knew would be acceptable to him and this scene was lovely and that's a collaboration. We've had it all year. From from the outset, Corey was responsible right. for for this show, and he has been uh, a, a proprietor of it. And I hope that we've satisfied you. I think we have. Well, I think you've done more than satisfied me. <laughs> well, Corey, cool. thank you so much for your part in bringing back our favorite show. And Michael, you've given so much and touched so many. Thank you for your continued showmanship on, you know, improving all of our lives just by bringing back those values and everything true that establishes a family life that we all strive for. I can't wait to see where this season goes. You guys can all tune in July 11th on the Disney Channel at 8.30. Thank you guys for being here, and Thank we'll you, see Kristen. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It was an honor to meet with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, guys. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV. Or so great. Right. Thank you for watching AfterBuzz TV on YouTube. For more of your favorite after shows and interviews, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to share your opinion on the episode in the comment section below here. We'd love to see what you guys are buzzing about. Thanks again. Buzz you later.